everybody. Uh, I'm Robin Scully from Perspective Gallery at Virginia Tech, um, taking you on today's art hike. And since this is our first one, I thought it would be fabulous to kind of look through our little backpack and decide what it is that we need to take. And of course, this is all optional and flexible, so I'm just going to give you some ideas of what an art hike might entail. Um, having supplies is the first thing you want, because if you are actually going to be drawing while you're hiking, um, it's good to have them in your backpack. And of course, having a nice pair of trusty hiking shoes. I like my Tevas, that's good too. But since you're gonna be doing this virtually, um, you can wear whatever you like. Um, in my art hike bag, I have um, several different types of paper, because I don't know whether I'm gonna to wanna to do a watercolor, so this is my watercolor pad, or whether I'm going to do just some sort of journaling and sketching with in my journal. So I like to have watercolor travel journal where I do drawings and then oftentimes I'll write about it too. And uh, so I have this with me too. But notice I have a small pack, so it's not like I'm carrying a ton of stuff. And then inside of my little bag here, I have this really awesome paintbrush, which you can unscrew the cap not going to come undone. And fill it with water. <laughs> Sometimes they get stuck. So, And then you don't have to have a special container for water to do watercolors with. And then I really like a portable watercolor kit too. And these little koi's are very nice. The colors are good. And um, they come with a little foldable paintbrush like this that will fit inside of here. So that anytime you want to sketch, and that's what I did with this. This is what I actually did when I was in Portugal last summer. Um, you just pull out your sketchbook, pull out your little pad, uh, your little watercolor container, and your brush, and you can just start laying in color. So when I did this sketch, I was sitting in a, at the Golbeckian uh, Botanical Gardens, and I just just put in the color of everything that was around me. And then when I got back home, I elaborated using the ink. So um, that was kind of a fun memory that I had when I was um, home from that trip to the botanical gardens. Let's see, some other things you should have in your art hike bag. I like to have crazy color Sharpies because you never know when you want to be wild rather than normal. And, um, you can also have some paint brushes that do not have water in them. Those are some extra ones. And uh, I have a limited number of colored pencils in here, but having colored pencils are also very good. Um, and I think I have one more little thing. I have my little sketchbook here that I take with me and it, this one fits all kinds of places and it, it gives me the opportunity to do all kinds of nice little drawings on a, on a fly. But what's missing is my black ink pen which is my handy dandy thing that I use all the time. Maybe it's in another place. I don't see it. Oh well. The one thing that I need, right? <laughs> um, oh look, here's another one of these. Maybe this one won't screw. They're all, they're all stuck on there. I don't know what the deal is. So, when we go on the hike, what we're going to do is stop at places and take a contemplative moment and get into the details of the place as well as get a feeling for the bigger picture of where you are. Um, listening to the birds, feeling the wind blow, um, paying attention to the angle of the sun and other small nuances that make your place a really important aspect of what you're drawing. So I'm going to put this all back in my backpack and then we're going to go for a little hike up into the woods and we'll take a moment to decide what our next drawing is going to be. Come on up, let's go for a little hike in the woods and see what's waiting for us to explore.
This is something you might just pass by normally. This is a wineberry bush. And anybody who's had a wineberry knows how wonderful they are. They have another name as jewel wheat, jewelberry. And um, in one of our new next art hikes, I will show you what it looks like in a month. But right now, the little flowers for the plant are out. And the flowers are going to turn into a beautiful ruby red raspberry-like fruit in the second week of July. And so these are very beautiful and soft flowers, but they do have a prickly vine. And Bender, my dog, is going to lead the way. The thing I'm noticing right now is the smell. It smells very beautiful out because we have a lot of wildflowers blooming in the woods. There's um, roses, the multi-floor rose are blooming, and I don't see any directly here, so they must be like moving up from the, the lower levels where the sun is hot on them and it's, the, the air is cooling and they're moving the smell up the hill. And the other thing that's blooming are a lot of little viburnums, which are, a beautiful little flower that grows kind of on these bushy shrubs that are probably not native, but they do smell good. Multiflora rose isn't native either. That is a tufted titmouse we hear. So we're walking on a north-facing mixed hardwood forest. Slope, which is in a kind of agricultural slash residential area. And there's a whole bunch of wine berries out there, so you can see there's going to be a lot to eat here in the next month. And as I'm walking, I'm thinking about things that I might want to just sit down and find a comfortable place, maybe a little sun on me. There's a butterfly, yellow swallowtail. There's been a lot of those this spring. They're all emerging now. that we walk by all the time and really don't pay a lot of attention to is bark. And I like to get people to consider what color bark is. You know, when we look at it, you know, it looks, everybody thinks, when I ask that question a lot of times, I get the answer, brown, bark is brown. Well, it's brown in some places, but it's also got some places that are green. And then we have some lichens here, so it's kind of a dusty blue-green. Um, these areas in here are grayish. Um, and the, the, the different colors help to create those textural qualities. Those are some of the things that we're going to be doing on art hikes, is thinking about how we can, number one, connect to what we're seeing and make that an important part of our drawing, not what we want somebody to think about, but what we see. We, we don't want people to have to be looking at it thinking, you're a good artist, you're a bad artist. We want you to be looking at it thinking about what is it that I'm seeing and what is it that I'm feeling while I'm looking at this stuff? And it's your interpretation. So looking at textural quality and interpreting that through your own eye and your colors of the bark that you're seeing, interpreting that through your own eye are things that we're going to be thinking about. Maybe this would be a good place for me to actually take out my sketchbook and, and look a little bit at bark and what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna draw my bark. We're going to do what I consider like a close-up and personal drawing of the bark of a tree. And you're like, really? The bark of a tree? And I want to give a shout out to a colleague of mine who does really beautiful tree drawings. Her name is Jennifer Hand, and some of you might know her because she teaches in the art department at Virginia Tech. But she does these beautiful contemplative drawings of bark. And I'm sort of being inspired by her work right now. Um, the, and, and I do, I have done a lot of bark drawings myself and actually do a little class with kids called What Color is Bark? Because as we were talking about earlier, um, bark is not necessarily just brown. So 
first of all, I'm going to really just sort of look at the overall textural quality of this tree. And I'm going to feel it, too. And this is a poplar, I believe. Yeah, it is. And it has all of these cool little nooks and crannies and grooves and things that we might not ever really pay attention to. We would just walk right by. And, but they're really beautiful and each one of them has uh, a totally different shape and color. And so I'm just gonna take a few minutes now and start intuitively drawing. Like maybe I'm just gonna take and draw this spot right here. And I'm just going to blow it up and draw all of these little nooks and crannies. And I'm not going to be worried about whether it looks exactly like that or that I even know how to do it. What I'm going to be doing is just letting my eye guide my hand and just contemplate these shapes in this space. So as I do that, I'm not going to talk because if you talk, you're using a part of your brain that's not focusing on drawing. Blocking my path, though. It's like, you know, little animals walking up the side with four little legs. And they're little animals, like, walking all over the place here. It looks like sideways with all these little legs, <laughs> which I hadn't even really noticed before. So this is the idea of stopping to really contemplate something you would never spend time looking at. And it really helps you to relax and also get in touch with things that are important but not necessarily observed. I'm fine. I'm fine. I know. They're like, you're not moving. What's wrong with you? You're always doing something and you're just sitting down. And I'm focusing on line in this drawing. I'm going to go in and do shading later. Right now I'm just trying to get some lines in. Because it's kind of cool. What you could also do with this, after you've started getting your line drawing in, is you could go in with this at home at night, and you could color it in and make something totally abstract and wild. It doesn't have to be necessarily tree bark. It could end up by being just an abstract drawing with inspired by the bark of a tree. And the more you get into it, the more you'll notice your brain shifting into this quiet, peaceful, non-linear mode, non-temporal, time flies. And you might even just start making stuff up.
and then you can start working on value after you've done a lot of your line drawing. And value is the darkest darks and the lightest lights and everything in between. And using value helps to create form in your work. So it goes from being more linear and flat to having dimensionality. It's an option. You don't have to do it, but you can play around with it. It's another level of moving into observing. And when the light is changing, if you're actually looking at what you're drawing and trying to mimic the light, you're going to find it very challenging because the idea that light stays in one place when the sun is moving is wrong. <laughs> it does not stay in one place. That's why Monet would do up to 50 paintings of the same scene because the light kept moving. And so he'd paint for 20 minutes and then he'd pick up the next canvas and he'd paint the light as it was then and then it would change and he'd pick up the next canvas. on that Monet, so. That's why the contemplative part of this, sitting quietly for a while, will lead you there so that you're not judging all the time and saying what you're doing doesn't look like what you're looking at. I mean, if that's your goal, you can do that. But also, if you stop judging while you're drawing, you'll find that it will look like what you're drawing, what you're looking at, because your individual vision may be very different from what you're actually looking at. Your unique ability to see something in a new way will make your art something new in the world. So there's really no right or wrong way to do this, which is kind of a relief in a way, because everything we do usually has a right or wrong way so much of what we do. So art hikes allow you to get out of the yes, no, right, wrong, black, white aspect of the things that we do. So I'm really getting into this and I'm excited about the process that I'm involved in here, just really looking at this and drawing it. So I'm going to continue drawing it and get it filled in and then I'm going to take it and have this available to me to continue on with the meditative aspect of shading in, in between my busy workload. It will be my sort of downtime in between doing the hard work that I do every day to make the gallery work, but this will relax me in between that. So um, I will have this done probably the next time we meet. So I'm excited about showing you how this process led me to a finished drawing and how I was allowed later on to use my imagination to finish it up. So that's a really exciting part of it is that you take a, an object that you wouldn't normally look at, you study it, you draw kind of what you're seeing, but then it turns into something totally different. And then you take it away and you allow yourself to enjoy the work you did in another level. So until next time, have a good day. Mm -hmm.